Welcome to York County History Center's Writers' Roundtable. My name is Jamie Kinsley. So this is a group of researchers and writers and historians that are mostly located in York County, but you don't have to be. And we like to get together every few months and talk about our projects and things that are happening about the community. So tonight's lineup, we're going to have Dominic Miller speak about York Newberry Town history. But before we do that, we have uh, Nicole Smith. She's going to give us some updates about the History Center. And then Jim McClure is going to come up and talk about some updates that are happening. That'll take about five to 10 minutes. So if you're tuned in to watch Dami, she'll begin in about 10 minutes. Here's Nicole. Thanks, Jamie. And thank you all for coming and watching uh, online. Uh, just a couple announcements from the History Center. Uh, if you are watching at home, uh, and if you have any questions during the program, please type them in the chat or the comments on Facebook, and we'll uh, take a look at those at the end of the presentation. Um, all of our programs and webinars are being live streamed on the History Center Facebook page, and um, most are also being recorded and will be available on the History Center YouTube page. We have a lot going on right now at the History Center. Uh, just a couple upcoming events. Uh, September 15th is the Civil War Roundtable. The speaker is Matt Borders, and he'll be speaking about the Third Confederate Invasion of 1864. That program will be in person and streamed online. Let's see. On September 16th, we have the History Center's annual membership meeting and awards. That's at 5.30. On Saturday, September 18th, we're offering an oral history training session for volunteers uh, from 9.30 to 1.30. Anyone who's interested in learning how to do oral history interviewing, uh, just give me a call for more information. And on September 24th, we have our York County History Center Art and Leisure Disco Inferno. It's a fundraising event and auction. So hope to see you there. Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, this is the heart of the uh, of the roundtable is to hear what members are are working on. And so we have several members here tonight that would come up to the podium here and, and briefly uh, tell us about some of their projects. Uh, maybe we can start with uh, uh, Steve. Stephen. Uh, you want to go first? No. Okay. Stephen Smith. Uh, hi, I'm Steve Smith. I have uh, eight talks coming up in the next two months, but uh, three of them are public talks, so I'll talk about them. Uh, a Yorkshire walk uh, will be on September 18th at three o'clock, uh, where I walk through the, uh, the community with uh, members of the community and uh, tell a little bit about the history of it. Uh, the Yorkshire group, I think, has a uh, pretty active Facebook Page. So if you go to that page, you can learn more about it there. Uh, another one is History Night in Springsbury on October 13th. I will be talking about the uh, history of the Cadoris Navigation Works. Uh, I have some new photos of a guy that uh, will probably be presenting along with me uh, on uh, some of the runes that have been found for the Cadoris Navigation Works. So that'll be uh, an updated talk. Uh, another public one is October 28th at the Red Line Historic Society. Uh, I'll be talking about Barshingers of uh, Red Line, uh, primarily focusing on the Red Line Milling Company and Barshingers Mill. So those are the three talks. So thanks for giving me a chance to talk about them. <laughs> and uh, next, uh, Dennis Ness will tell about a new book that he has out. And it's interesting, it's on the American Revolution and that era. Era. So we don't see a lot of that nowadays. So it should be interesting. Go ahead. Thank you, Jim. Uh, over the past couple of years, I've wrote this, did a lot of research and wrote this book on the militia of York County. The records in York County are very, very disoriented. Uh, this is my, my way of trying to set the record straight. Uh, I go through the early parts of the Militia in Pennsylvania, and I take it all the way up to the end of the revolution. I don't have any specific 
battalions or things like that because it would have taken me too long to do all that. I just try to tell a story to get you interested because there's a second book on its way. I thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Rick Resch uh, is going to tell us about a project. Uh, he has several projects going on. I'm not sure which one he's going to talk about, but it'll be interesting. I think you're going to talk about uh, Marian Furness. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Good evening. Uh, West Behind Township Heritage Committee has been working on several projects over the last few years. Uh, it resulted in three books. One was the uh, book about the horse, Search for Horse and Friend. Uh, the second one was Where Was Working's Tavern. So the tavern was on the bottom of the pipe. Uh, it only showed up in two, map, two uh, township maps. Uh, the third book that we just completed earlier this year was The Six Investors in the Pleasantville Telephone Company. Uh, six private citizens funded the money for uh, extended telephone lines from uh, Hanover to, to Maryland Road in the early 1900s. Uh, the fourth book that I just completed for the Hanover Historical Society concerns the tunnels under the streets of Hanover. Back to fiction. So these are not only ground railroads, they're not storm sewer pipes. These were steam tunnel systems uh, that were built in the early 1900s uh, by the Hanley Power Company. There's also the uh, J.S. Young, this famous smokestack in Hanley, still standing, had a uh, tunnel system to serve some budding industries. We also found an article on the fire in an underground gallery next to the Amber Hotel. So we have a story about that. And finally, there's the an Indian legend about a three mile long tunnel built through the hills by Native Americans, which we you now determined is probably just fiction. Uh, earlier this year, I think on March 12th, uh, the Historical Society. Uh, for the township, funded the ground uh, entry radar, radar for the very first site, um, which did not come to any conclusions. It just opened up more areas that we can look at. We did find a, the practice of a mill race uh, in some artifacts, but we'll continue to work on that. It's still a big question mark in our county history of where exactly it was. Thank you. And then uh, lastly, we have uh, Tristan Malazzo from uh, our sister um, historical society up in uh, Cumberland County. You could tell us about an event or two going on there. Tristan? Yes, thank you. I, so I'm not your county, but I think this will be an interesting event that we have going on on October 9th. Uh, and I encourage you all to look into it more. Um, we're going to be doing our first annual gala with a twist, I like to say. Uh, so it'll actually be a fashion show. Uh, we partnered with about 11 local and regional fashion designers, sent them uh, some garments in our collection, pictures of them, and said, make a piece uh, inspired by these garments, and then we'll walk the fashion show. Uh, so this event is going to be not your normal sit-down gala, but a fashion show, silent auction, raffle, donated beer, cider, wine, appetizers. So we're hoping for about a 45-minute drive out in Carlisle, but we think it's going to be a fun night, and we hope um, some people in York County will join us too. Thanks. And then uh, Craig Calvin isn't here uh, tonight. I think he's, he's watching him. Uh, he'll be presenting uh, at the Renland Library on 6, at 630 on September 27th on the fire service in York County 100 years ago, 1921. And uh, that's sponsored by Nietzsche, uh, Northeastern York County History and Preservation, the Redland Community Library, and all vets of York. Uh, Greg's welcome to put any information on that uh, in the thread of the live stream that's going on right now. Uh, the last thing we'll have just real quickly is that the Journal of uh, York County Heritage will be out uh, any, really any day now. And that has uh, it has six, seven articles in it. Uh, and I won't go over all those articles, but uh, uh, Stephen Smith, who is here tonight, uh, has an article. Stephen Nicholas, several members of the York County 
uh, uh, Writers Roundtable uh, have uh, pieces in there. Stephen Nicholas, uh, Tom Davidson, Jay, our own Jamie Kinsley uh, is here tonight, Stephen Smith, uh, Ben Hoover, a uh, uh, medical doctor who has written about Dr. Julius Comro and his uh, remarkable family. Then we have uh, Jose Nicolón uh, Bonez, who um, is talking, writing about early Latino families in your county. And lastly, Susan Bauer and uh, Daniel Hesto uh, have written about Hanover Shoe Farm. So that's coming out uh, in the, any day. So here's the, the cover that shows uh, Annette Morgan Smith, uh, Wind Turbine, that's uh, it's going to be the lead story in the publication. Thank you very much. Can't wait to get my copy. That'll be a fun read. Okay, so now for tonight's main speaker. So Dami is going to speak. She is actually a friend of mine. I recently moved to Newberry Town, and so we live like a half mile, maybe, as the crow flies, probably a quarter mile away. And since I moved up to Newberry Town, I have realized how much amazing things are up there. It's really rich with history. So let me tell you a little bit about Dami. So Dami is first and foremost, I think is most interesting, a reenactor. Um, she is a part of the 87th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Company C, which is amazing. Um, she is also the founder of Preserving the History of Newberry Town Facebook group. And what's really cool, her and I just started this YouTube channel called Hometown History. So her and I go and talk about things that are happening around York, uh, especially Newburytown. And Jim helps us run that. And it's a part of Jim and I's effort called Witness in York. So Dami full-time works as the Third Circuit Court of Appeals librarian. Uh, and her program tonight will take us to about 8 o'clock. Oh, Dami. Hi everybody, thank you for coming tonight. Um, the name of my program is Putting Newburytown on the Map. And Newburytown is where I was born and raised. Um, my grandfather was born and raised in Newburytown. My parents still live there, or my aunts and uncles. So it's something that's really close to my heart and very important. So I want other people to love Newburytown as much as I do. Work. Down here. Did that work? No. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Was she sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, where is it? Oh, I did it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I did first enough. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, take two. Okay. <laughs> so. Now I'm going to take you on a tour north of the Conewago Creek because you're going to learn during this presentation that there's a lot to offer in Northern New York County and Newberry Town, while that is my hometown, is very close to some other great towns. So Newberry Town was incorporated in 1742. Um, Newberry Township was a haven for Quakers and Newberry Town in particular was named for the Newberry Friends Quaker congregation. And because it was a haven for Quakers, we have a lot of Quaker meeting houses. So the Newberry uh, Meeting House, which is actually called the Redlands Meeting House, which is pictured here. Um, this is one of the prominent Quaker meeting houses that is still in use. It was built in 1811. Um, there's also a barrow ground on site and it was two miles west of Newberry Town. So usually Quaker meeting houses were built 10 miles from the closest largest city. So think Harrisburg, think York City, and then about two miles apart from each other. And you can still visit this today. And I think it's every third Sunday of the month it is open to the public for meetings. And then this is another Quaker meeting house. This one is actually privately owned. So this was built in 1792. And if you're familiar with Newburytown, you'll know that there's the Y in Newburytown. That's what we call it. So Newberry Town goes either right or left of the Y. And this is on the left of the Y. And it's a private residence. And you can tell there was a second wing added to the house at some point. But it's across the street from the Newberry Friends burial ground. And again, Newberry Friends is what Newberry Town is named for. So 
So this is not necessarily the meeting house that was connected to the burial grounds. Um, I believe the church that was connected to the burial grounds, there's still a foundation there, um, but this is across the street. And this is an aerial view and then a photograph of the Newberry Friends burial ground. Um, Jamie and I actually just did a video there. Um, we did a video on prominent um, burial grounds and cemeteries in York County, and this is one that we featured. We actually sat in the burial grounds to do our video. Um, Shirley Will, who is a resident of Newberry Town, she worked across the street in once in what was once a one-room schoolhouse, and it turned into a beauty parlor that my aunt actually owned. And they would look out and they would see this was a very dilapidated cemetery. No one was taking care of it. Um, trees would fall over. They were having um, headstones that were crushed or falling over and no one was cutting the weeds. So Shirley actually spearheaded the initiative to contact the um, local Quakers and she got the funding secured for a local landscaper to come in. And I, it's probably every month that he comes in actually and um, cleans up the ground and maintains it. As you can see, it's fenced in. It is open to the public, so there's no locked gate. You can go in any time. If you do go in, please be respectful. Um, please be respectful of the private residences next door. Don't just park in your driveway without asking. But if you go in there, you'll see that this is probably the oldest burial ground or cemetery in Newberry Township. Um, no one was buried there after the Civil War. Um, there are veterans of the War of 1812 and the Revolutionary War buried there. Um, and I know that they're, because it is being taken care of actively, I'm sure that they're trying to restore the headstones, but there are some headstones that are probably past the point of repair. Um, Shirley did tell me that she has a list of everyone that they know is buried there. So there's probably people that they're not aware of that are buried there that have been lost to time, but um, she does have a list. And if you go on findagrave.com, you'll be able to find this burial ground and you'll be able to see some of the names that were buried there. And I know that she told me that um, something unique about some of the headstones is some of the letters are backwards. And now I don't know if that's a Pennsylvania Dutch thing or if that is a Quaker thing, um, but there are some letters, I think it's the letter S and the letter E are backwards on some of the tombstones. And then we have two things that are on the National Register of Historic Places in Newburytown. And one of them is the Hammersley Strominger House. Um, I'm actually related to the Strominger's. They're some of my ancestors. And you'll find out through this presentation that I'm probably somehow related to everyone in Newburytown. <laughs> Everyone's my cousin, whether they like it or not. Um, so this house was built in two phases. You can see that there's a log part and then there's a stone part. So the first section was built in 1790, and that was the log section of the house. The stone section was then built in 1835, and it was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1978. Um, this is a more current picture. So the house really does look like this. Um, it's a privately owned residence, and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, the people that own it take great care of it. You can drive through Newburytown and take pictures. Again, if you're going to stop at these places, please ask permission from the private owners before you just park in your driveway and take pictures. Um, and then we have Pikesville Bridge. So this is a historic Camelback Stone Arch Bridge, and it was built in 1915. It measures approximately 68 feet long, and it crosses a small body of water called Bennett's Run. So this is still in use. So this bridge... Um, it can be maintained, but they can't really change any of the structure because it is on the National Register of Historic Places, and it was placed on that in 1988. So thankfully, because of that, it will always be maintained and it will always be used. Um, it might be out of commission one day, and they might be able to build another bridge if they have to, but um, they're trying to keep it structurally sound so that it can be used and they don't need to replace it, but it will always be there. Um, and then you can see next to it is the stone that talks about when it was built in 1915. And then we're going to go on to one-room schoolhouses. So Newberry Township has a rich history of one-room schoolhouses, and I believe it is the York County History Center that has an archive of photographs of one-room schoolhouses. So you can see that I actually pulled one of the pictures um, from their archive, and that is the Newburytown one-room schoolhouse, and it is at the very center of the Y in Newburytown. Um, 
And if you look at the picture right next to it, the little boy that is directly in center is my grandpa. He's the one smiling. So he lived down the street from this women's schoolhouse and he attended with all of his brothers and sisters. And then there's also some other family members sprinkled throughout there. <laughs> Um, so the women's schoolhouses, you know, the kids were walking there, they weren't getting bused there. A lot of them would hitchhike to school. So when you hear about, I walked both ways uphill in the snow, they really did, <laughs> at least in Newbury Town, because the Y is sort of on top of a hill. Um, but this particular women's schoolhouse was then purchased by my aunt, Nancy Wise, and she turned it into a beauty parlor. And then it became a pizza shop for a little while. Um, became a beauty parlor again, and it is right now a beauty parlor. And then um, the other picture I have was submitted to me through my Facebook group, Preserving the History of Newburytown, and that's Drawball School. I believe it's dated um, 1948, but um, someone that attended that school um, gave me that photograph on Facebook. So it's been great because people can look at these pictures and they can pick out their mom, their dad, their grandma, their grandpa. And then we're going to move on because, like I said, um, everything north of the Conewago is of interest to me. So Newberry Township is going to then take us to Fairview Township. And the land that makes up Fairview Township was a part of Newberry Township until 1803 when it became its own entity. And then there's Lewis Ferry. So the land around Lewis Ferry um, was under control of the Susquehannock Indians until the first Quaker settlements happened in the 1730s. The borough is named for its founder, Eli Lewis, who was born nearby, not necessarily in the borough, in 1750. And he's the son of one of the original settlers of the Lewis Ferry Borough area. By the middle of the 19th century, Lewis Ferry was producing a large number of coffee grinders. So um, I know someone on our Facebook group just said the movie Dances with Wolves. If you look in one of the scenes, there's a Lewis Berry coffee grinder in there. So that's a fun little fun fact that you can look up. Um, and every once in a while, one of them will be at a antique store or go up for auction. So it's nice for locals to be able to buy those things back. Then in 1837, Lewis Berry native um, Kirby Hammond began to manufacture the Hammond window sash spring. And his claim to fame is that in 1838, President Van Buren installed the springs in all of the White House windows. So we have a Lewis Berry invention that made it all the way to the White House. And our claim to fame here in Lewis Berry, besides our window sash spring, is that the 2015 U.S. Little League champs made it all the way um, to the U.S. Championship. And ESPN credited Lewis Berry for being the birthplace of the Little League team. Uh, the National Register of Historic Places, again, there's two places in Fairview Township, and that's the Edders Bridge, and we're going to talk more about Edders in a little bit, but the Edders Bridge is also known as the Greenland Bridge, and it's a historic Pratt Trust Bridge, and it crosses the Yellow Breaches Creek. It was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1986, and then we have the Ashton Hirsch House. It was also built in stages, like the house I talked about about before, and uh, it was first built in 1764 and then added to in 1830. Um, the outbuilding may date back to as early as 1734, and it's believed to be one of the oldest occupied structures that exists in New York County. And it was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2003. And then we get to Redland High School, which is located in Fairview Township, and it has a Lewis Ferry address. So Redland High School was dedicated in 1965, and it is known for being uh, Redland because of the red clay soil. So the Redland area encompasses Fairview Township, Lewis Ferry, there's places in Newberry Township that are referred to as Redland. And that is the West Shore School District, which also um, encompasses Lewisbury, Goldsboro, Fairview Township, Newbury Township, Newbury Town. And that brings us to Goldsboro. So Goldsboro is the home of Edders. So Henry Edder established Edders Tavern, which then became Edders Post Office in 1838. And post offices were privately owned at that time. Goldsboro was founded in 1850 upon the completion of the railroad from York Haven to Harrisburg. So this was a big deal. It gave people ease of travel. 
The village was named Goldsboro in honor of J.M. Goldsboro, the civil engineer of the railway. And you can see that on the historical plaque that is um, standing in Goldsboro. It tells you that. The post office in Goldsboro is named Edders, even though there is no incorporated place known as Edders. The United States Post Office states the name Edders is preferred over Goldsboro for addressing mail in the 17319 zip code. So we're going to get back to Henry Edder and his little town place called Edders. Another claim to fame for Goldsboro is Three Mile Island. Everyone knows about TMI, unfortunately. The partial meltdown happened on March 28, 1979, and that is why Jimmy Carter visited us on April 1st, 1979. It then closed and was decommissioned on September 20th, 2019. And one of the things that a lot of locals did was they would take pictures with their family in front of the smokestacks. Um, they might go down by the river or a lot of people can see the smokestacks from their house, the steam stacks from their house. So they would take a picture when the steam was still coming out. And then after it was decommissioned, they took a picture when there was no steam anymore. And my parents, um, they were in Newbury Township when Three Mile Island had their partial meltdown and they worked for DuPont. And DuPont told them that they could either stay in the building or leave, but once you left the building, you couldn't come back in because of radiation exposure, possibly. Um, so they went home and my mom said you could feel your skin was sort of tingly and um, the hair on your arms stood up. And they ended up staying at our house on Stevens Road. Um, they didn't flee, a lot of people did. Um, my aunt and uncle went to Delaware and they said they actually got some more radiation there than people got here because of the way the wind traveled. Yoakum Town in York Haven. So, uh, Yoakum Town is named for William Yoakum. Yoakum Town boasted a tannery, a blacksmith shop, and a schoolhouse, and that was all before it became Yoakum Town. It officially became a town when someone built a house there in 1814, and we can thank Thomas Mills for that. And then in York Haven, and that was founded in 1814, and it's named for being a haven for transportation. It was very close to the Susquehanna River. Um, there was a ferrying business in York Haven. And then we get to where the heck is Edders? So this is a big conversation for locals. Maybe not necessarily for locals, but for people that aren't familiar with the area. So this is a newspaper article that someone submitted to me on the Facebook page. And then you have this one, Edders, named not even on the map. And it shows you a picture of Goldsboro, which is home to Greg Gross, the baseball player. And then we have an article, where is Edders? Redland gives sports fan a look at Central PA's um, eccentric geography. So people who live in Edders have a unique claim to fame. Um, they have a place listed on their driver's license that isn't listed on a map. You're not going to ever find a map that says Edders, Pennsylvania. Um, for the people who aren't born and raised in Newberry Township, this can be confusing, and I, I get it. Um, you can remember when the Redland Little League team made it to the Little League World Series in 2015. ESPN had no idea how to explain where they were from. And I remember watching the live broadcast. They were so confused. They were looking at maps of Pennsylvania. They were looking at the demographics. Louis Bear, I think they said it was home to like 350 to 500 people. How did they create a championship Little League team? Well, they kind of didn't because they were from all over the Redland area. Uh, Redland, for instance, isn't even a town. It's just a name that we call the area. Um, it's an area of central Pennsylvania that contains red clay soil. Redland encompasses Lewisbury, which has Redland High School, Edders, the Redland Community Library, and Newbury Township. When Robert Lambert, who is the president of the York County Library System, visited the Redland Library for the first time, he was overheard saying, I didn't realize it meant that the land was red. So yeah, and if you're a gardener, you know, the soil's not the best. You have to find plants that live in clay soil. Uh, Nancy Heilman was quoted by Penn Live during the Redland Little League saga by saying, there is a town in Pennsylvania named Goldsboro. So to avoid confusion, the post office in Goldsboro was named Edders. In the early days, post offices were privately owned. The first post office in the Goldsboro area was owned by Henry Edder, and that was about 1838. Even with these explanations, things remain confusing for people, and I understand that. You can live in Valley Green, which is in Newbury Township. You can have an Edders mailing address, 
and you can have your post office be in Goldsboro. Or you can technically own a home in the New Cumberland area, which is in Fairview Township, but you're going to tell people that you live in Lewisbury because it's easier for the locals to find you. And then even Google Maps uh, has gotten in on this debate. So while the 17319 zip code is for errors, all of the addresses with that zip code appear as Goldsboro on Google Maps. So Karen Hofstetter, the director of the Redland Community Library, said, my favorite editor story, trying to get Google to stop calling us Goldsboro. I even sent them the phone number of the editor's postmasters. They wouldn't budge because of the very reputable source they use, Wikipedia. I know there's some teachers out there just grumbling right now, Wikipedia. Um, if you read that very reputable Wikipedia page, you're going to see the following explanation. And it even says, it says, for historical reasons, the post office in Goldsboro is named Edders, even though there's no incorporated place known by that name. And the U.S. Postal Service states that the name Edders is preferred over Goldsboro. But we're going to confuse you anyways, and Google Maps is still going to continue to call it Goldsboro, even though you're one of mail things to Edders. So imagine being a truck driver driving into town. They tell you got to drop stuff off at Edders. You can't find it. You're going to end up so confused and you're going to get off of the yokum town exit <laughs> so that's even more confusing still confused here are a few facts so the 17319 zip code equals edders which is technically in goldsboro the edders is a post office it's not a town it's not a place you're going to find on the map edders post office is in goldsboro which is a town it's a borough Edders is named for Henry Edder, the private owner of the post office at the time. Redland is not a town. Redland encompasses a few towns. So Redland is Lewisbury, Yoakum Town, Newberry, and York Haven. And the area known as Redland was named for the red clay soil in northern York County. And that brings me to the fact that my passion for local history and explaining these things made me um, move forward with creating a Facebook group. So during the pandemic, I started teleworking. Um, usually I work in Harrisburg and I found myself teleworking at home and I found myself looking through family photo albums and getting more into genealogy. And I thought there's gotta be someone else in Newberry Township that's as interested in the local history as I am. So I created the Facebook group, Preserving the History of Newberry Town. And it now has over 2,500 members, and it's a group dedicated to preserving, collecting, researching, and interpreting historical information over items north of the Conewago Creek. So while the name says preserving the history of Newburytown, I want to preserve the history of Northern New York County above the Conewago Creek. Um, I established the group on July 18th, 2020, and I'm so happy a year later. Um, I mean, it got me here talking about Newburytown, so I think it's working just fine. And I also established an Instagram account because Instagram and Facebook sort of go hand in hand. So that is called at Newberry Town History. And that has um, 750 followers at the time I made this presentation. It had 736, so thank you to my new followers. And I also developed a website with one of my friends. He's an IT guy. And it's called preservingnewburytown.org. And it went live last night. So it's very bare bones. And we need to add more things to it, but um, you can officially go visit my website. And it has the events that I'll be speaking at. It has the t-shirts that I'm selling. <laughs> um, I'm selling some New Town merchandise. You can get a cool mug, a t-shirt, a onesie for your baby, a mask. Um, and it also has, it's gonna have pictures, basically anything that you're gonna find on our social media accounts is gonna be on the website. We're gonna flesh it out. But I want to open this up to any questions or comments because I want to talk about um, the archiving side of things, the preservation side of things. So it's all fun and games on social media, but you have to have the information to back it up. And that's where my degree in library science really comes in handy. So I went to Clarion University and I have my master's in library science, but I also have a concentration in archiving and local history. Um, and, you know, it's really important when you're trying to preserve local history, you have to start at the source. And the main source is going to be the people. So you're going to want to talk to the older people in town because those are the ones that are going to have the most knowledge. And you want to get to those people before they pass away, before those memories 
fade away. So I say if you're going to start preserving history, even if it's family history, get those oral histories from the older people in your town, the older people in your family. The local library. I can't say enough great things about the Redland Community Library and the York County Library System as a whole. They have just about anything you need to know about local history. And because they're a York County library system, they have materials about York County and Newburytown in particular. Um, then you're going to go to your local historical society, to your local history center. You can come here to the York County History Center. They have um, books, they have papers, they have photographs. Uh, as you can see in my PowerPoint, I use one of their photographs of the one room schoolhouse. So really, you're just going to start looking through their archives for things. And it could be your family history. You know, you could have family photos that are archived and you don't even realize it. Um, and then you're going to go on some databases. So Ancestry.com, you could use that for free through your local historical society, or you could get a private um, subscription and pay for it. You can use an Ancestry DNA test or a 23andMe DNA test. It was easy for me. I knew I was half Italian. I knew I was half German. Um, so my DNA test didn't tell me anything that I didn't already know. But there are people out there that maybe they were adopted or maybe, you know, their parents passed away when they were younger and they weren't able to ask the questions. So um, anyone else that has an Ancestry DNA test or an Ancestry account, if they match with you, you can match on there and get to know each other for your family tree. Um, FamilySearch.org is a free genealogical database. So if you don't want to take the plunge and pay a monthly subscription, that's another great resource. I use both of them and I combine the information that I find with both of them. Um, and then there's findagrave.com. And this is a little morbid, but some people have a hobby where they like to go to um, grave sites and take pictures at cemeteries and they catalog them. So anyone can do it and it doesn't have to be a tombstone from someone you know. It could be a complete stranger, but you're gonna take a picture of it and then you're gonna put that information on findagrave.com and then it's searchable. So if I'm looking for my grandfather's tombstone, if it is cataloged on the website, I can type in his name, I could type in the location of the cemetery, or I could type in his birth date and death date, and it's going to bring it up for me. So that's a really great resource. Local newspapers. So I can't say enough great things about local newspapers. You saw that I had some newspaper clip clippings about editors. Um, those were given to me as hard copies, and then I scanned them. So if you have any local newspapers that you're keeping in your attic or you're keeping at your house, please digitize them. Um, I'm sure everyone has had the experience that they've gone to someone's house, gone up into the attic, and there's some musty newspapers. They're yellow, they're crumbling, they're falling apart. Those are the type of things that you're gonna to wanna to digitize um, to keep for generations to come. Um, keep them in a box, put tissue paper between the pages, lay them flat, don't leave them. Um, crumbled up, don't leave them folded over because those seams are gonna rip. So you're gonna to wanna to, um, mine local newspapers for information and then you're gonna to wanna to either write it down or digitize it. Then there's newspapers.com. So you can pay for the subscription and I'm sure you can use it for free, um, probably through your local historical society. But this is great because you can search the entire nation for different newspapers. So if your local history is Illinois and it's not Pennsylvania, you can search for those newspapers one newspapers.com and you can search back to the beginning of time really if um, it's digitized on there. You know, not everything is one newspapers.com, but a lot of stuff is. So that's a great resource. And then family photo albums. Again, you're going to want to go to the source. So your own family is going to have a lot of knowledge that you can use. I can't tell you how important it is to write down names and dates on photographs. Please, there's so many people who have family photographs that just one or two generations back, they don't know who they are and they throw them away or they give them away to state sales. You know, it's really sad when you go to an antique store and you see someone's family photo albums and it's because they don't know who the people are in the photographs. Uh, one thing that I really liked about my grandpa, when he was in the war, he went um, to Germany. He wasn't sent to Korea. He stayed in Germany and he wrote the name of every person in the photograph that he took and he wrote their hometown. So I thought that was so cool. You know, there was people that he met from across the country, across the world, and he had their names in their hometown. So if I really wanted to, I could probably contact their families. Um, it probably wouldn't be that hard to find them. But, you know, it's just so nice because if you're looking at a photograph of your great aunt when she was 18, she obviously doesn't look the same. 
So it, it's hard to know who's in the photographs that you're looking at. So please write the date on them and please mark down who's in each photograph. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. I grew up in Newburgh Town and I went to school with your aunt and uncle. <laughs> I, she grew up in Newburgh Town and went to school with my aunt and uncle. Which aunt and uncle? Uh, Nancy. Nancy Wise. Well, she wasn't Nancy Wise. She was an Ernie before she was a wife. Uh, yes. Dave Wise. Dave Wise. Okay. My family's been in that area since the 1750s. His family has been in the area since the 1750s. They had a their Bennett's run. Yes. They had a uh, piece of land down there. Since the 1750s. Your family. The Petros estate. Uh, his family, the Petros, had a piece of land by Bennett's run since the 18 or the 1750s. 1750s. That's great. Well, thank you for coming tonight. It's nice to have a local here. <laughs> Anything else? What would you say uh, is the difference between those who those living north of the Conalago and those living south in terms of their consumer habits? In, in terms of their sports team preferences and so on. Okay, so we have a question from Jim in the audience, and he wants to know what the difference is between people north of the Conewago and south of the Conewago when it comes to consumer preferences and sports teams. So this is a loaded question because I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. So um, I'm probably the yeah I know I'm I'm getting some grunts in the audience. Um, I'm probably like the only one in Newbury Town, sorry in Pennsylvania for that matter. Um, so I'm not really sure. I know everyone is a Redland Little League fan. I don't care who you are. If you're in York County, you were rooting for those kids in 2015, and they're awesome. Um, I would say that as far as sports preferences go, north of Oconomowoc, we're really into Redland High School athletics. Um, if you're south of Oconomowoc, it might be Central School District, um, more York City oriented, more um, York City School District. Or oriented as far as that goes. Um, shopping, I think people south of the Conewago probably come closer to York City for consumerism. Um, north of the Conewago, I remember before we had a Walmart, you went to the Super Fresh in Newbury Commons, or you drove all the way into New Cumberland to go to the Giant, which seemed like a really far drive, and I don't know why, it's like 10 minutes away. Um, but now we have a Carnes, a family owned business there, and we have a Walmart. Um, so, you know, we're really on a map. We have a KFC too, we have Taco Bell. We're really like getting up there in the world. Um, but I wouldn't say there's that many differences, but I think people that are north of the Conewago sort of stick to north of York City. I don't know a lot of people that travel to York City all that often, and there's nothing wrong with York City. I just think we like to stick to our neck of the woods a little bit. And yes, Jim. <laughs> where, where is Valley Green? Okay, so Valley Green. Jim wants to know about Valley Green. So Valley Green is a place. It's a golf course. It's a housing development. So Valley Green is in Newbury Township. So again, there's a golf course called the Valley Green Golf Course, and they have a restaurant called Hogan's. And there's a lot of houses, so townhouses. There's the Valley Green townhouses. Um, and that is in the Newbury Township, Newbury Town area. I see laughter. Really, <laughs> dirt in the chair about her aunt and uncle. <laughs> I was around when a lot of that stuff was built. Jack Short built that. I remember that when I was a child, that was built. Jack Short built the golf course? The golf course, and then later the house is Jess. And the houses. Jack Short, whoever you are, if you're still around, you built the golf course. No, <laughs> he's passed. He's passed. I, I lived there when they put the expressway through. Oh, you did? He lived there when they put the expressway through. Yeah, that was a big deal. That cut through a lot of people's backyards. Yeah, well, I was five or six years old. You could drive down on, on that road before they paid. My, my grandparents took me down to see the, the tunnel on the bridge, and they put it on the tree down there. That's what you should give this talk. <laughs> he is telling me that um, his grandparents would take him down to see where the Conewago Bridge was built and that he could drive along the road before the expressway was put in when they were starting to build the expressway. Um, actually, I want to point out, since we're talking about the expressway, 
There's a book that every Newburytown resident should have, and it's Newbury Township, The Beginning, 1700 to 1900. And one of the authors of this, um, Mr. Wise, he actually, um, he actually has a lot of photographs that his family took of the construction of the expressway. Um, he hasn't shared a lot of them because um, a lot of the kids in his family are in the photographs, so he wants to keep those private. Um, but he has a lot of pictures of the construction with just like the big machinery and everything because it really was in everyone's backyards when it came through. Um, eminent domain took a lot of properties, a lot of farmland when the um, expressway was put through Newburytown. My mother is 95, 94 years old. His mother is 94 years old. She lived, she lived up there all her life, too. She lived there her whole life. Yeah, you know, it's. I think maybe it's not that unique. Maybe I just need to talk to more people. But I think something great about Newburytown is it seems like people stay there. There's a lot of people who were born and raised there, and their children are staying. I know my grandfather, for instance, he grew up across from Newberry Elementary School. His parents owned the house across from Newberry Elementary School, and then he and his sister Pansy lived there until they passed away. Um, I know he talked about my aunt and uncle. Um, my great grandparents, the Ernies, they had a homestead on Stevens Road. Um, their daughters each took a piece of land, and they uh, live, one lives right below them, right below the homestead, one lives across the street from the homestead and then my grandmother built the house that I live in now in 1964 down the street on Stevens Road. My parents ended up buying it from her when they got married and now I have the house. Um, so you know it's like we like to stay close to home. Um, one of the jokes at Redland High School was be careful who you date it's probably your cousin. <laughs> so whether that's a good claim to fame or not I don't know but it, it's sort of true. I had two cousins in the same grade as I was in and in first grade we were in the same first grade class. So that's pretty unique. Um, like I said, you're, you're probably related to everyone in Newburytown if you were born and raised there. Um, it's six degrees of separation. Jamie? Um, so with the Facebook group, uh, there were some posts that had me cracking up. Like, you know you're from Newburytown. Oh yeah. So have there been any posts that you felt were particularly remarkable or maybe something that surprised you by starting the Facebook group? Um, so Jamie was saying there was a few funny posts on the Facebook group. Um, I started a thread called, you know, you're from Newburytown if. So some of those answers were really great. Um, but she wants to know if I've noticed any remarkable posts. I think what I enjoy the most is, for instance, the pictures of the one room schoolhouses. Those are pictures that people are sharing that they inherited from their parents or from their grandparents. So I just, I really like the fact that People are keeping their own family histories alive. Um, Paddletown Church, for instance, is a church that a lot of people attended. Um, a lot of people have ancestors and family members, uh, a gentleman in the audience, he knows what I'm talking about. They have their ancestors buried in the Paddletown Cemetery. And Paddletown was known for having these great little picnics where you would go, the whole community would get together in an afternoon and there'd be chicken corn soup and there'd be a band that plays. And that's what, I, that's what I like about Newburytown, and that's what I like about this Facebook group, is it's bringing back the memories. So many people have said to me, you know, thank you for creating the Facebook group because there's things that I have forgotten, or these are things that I can't necessarily talk to other people about because they're not from here, they don't have the same memories that I do. And for me, my grandfather was so well connected in the community, he knew everyone. He would sit on his front porch, he had a front porch swing and he was right across from the Newberry Elementary School and he'd wave at every car that drove by because it was the main road through town. And he waved at every school bus because you can never remember which school bus number my brother and I rode. <laughs> so I can't tell you how many people I went to school with that said, oh yeah, oh, that was your grandpa. We just called him like the front porch guy because he would wave every day, but you know, like, those are just memories that I hold on to because my grandpa passed away in 2009, but I can go to almost any person above 50 in Newburytown and bring up the name Claire Brooks and they know exactly who I'm talking about. And, you know, it's nice to know that um, there's nothing but nice things to say about him. So that makes me feel really good. And even my grandma, um, Betty Ernie, uh, she was Betty Weber afterwards but like the Ernie family because they had such a long history in town it's nice to be able to know that even though she's passed away I can go to a lot of people in town and they know who I'm talking about and they can share a memory with me 
of, uh, you know, just knowing them from town, going to school with them, um, working an odd job here and there, like a grocery store, a speed store, um, you know, so it's nice to be so connected. So I think that's what the Facebook group has really done for me and a lot of other people, especially during the pandemic when we've been stuck at home, it's given them a platform to be able to reminisce and share things with people. And that's why I want to, you know, do more speaking engagements like this. That's why I want to have the Instagram and the Facebook page and the website because not everyone is tech savvy, not everyone's on social media, but it, it's been fun because a few people have said, I'll get an email here and there. I don't have Facebook, but my grandkids saw your um, your Facebook page and they told me I should email you and ask a question or you brought this up and I wanted to share more. So that's been really special. So I've gotten to know the town in a different way. Yes. Um there's someone in commenting, Sam Dorn, who is uh, asking, how did the creeks in proximity to the river impact jobs and farming? Okay, uh, Samantha Dorn wants to know how did the creeks in proximity to the rivers impact um, jobs as far as farming and stuff? Um, yeah, so the area um, has a lot of agriculture. There was a lot of farms, there was burying. Um, so being close to bodies of water really helped the area prosper. So York County has a rich history of mills, so you need water to run a mill. Um, so there's a building in town called the Blue Sky Tavern, um, which actually was called the Red Mill. And it's had nine lives. It's, it's been a mill, it's been a boarding house, it's been restaurants. Um, so you, you need those bodies of water to, um, you know, to push along that agriculture, you need water if you're farming. You need water, obviously, if you're running a ferrying business, if you're transporting goods on boats. So I think it only helped. I think the proximity to bodies of water helps the area prosper. Yes. Uh, we do have a couple, one question on uh, Zoom. Uh, can you tell us about your behavior? Yes, I let me go back to your cave Can I go back on here? Yeah. Okay. okay, so we want to know more about your cave -in. So your cave is below geographically is below Newberry Township. Um, it's very small, but it's also very close to the river. So you can see TMI from your cave in um, your cave -in. Um, because it was so close to the river, was known for its water transportation along the Susquehanna River. Um, although it's a smaller town, it, there's still a lot of people there. There was a lot of churches there. Um, Holy Infant Catholic Church was in York Haven for many years before it recently moved to Manchester. Um, but York Haven has a library. It was home to the York Haven Bank. A lot of people have yardsticks or other promotional things that say York Haven Bank on them. Um, that was also a big thing on the Preserving the History of Newbury Town Facebook page. A lot of people were reminiscing about um, getting their first savings account or their first checking account at the York Haven Bank. Um, so yeah, York Haven has a really rich history in the area and it's really tied to the Susquehanna River and that sort of goes back to Samantha's question. Um, if it wasn't for the river and it wasn't for the accessibility to the water, I don't think York Haven would have been as prosperous as it is now. Tommy, just one more. Uh, yeah. What would you uh, what would you say to organizations that are really wanting uh, more involvement from young people in local history? Sure. You know, a lot of a lot of organizations are uh, maybe they feel like they're aging. What would you say to them? Sure. So Jim brings up a good question. What would I say to organizations that want more participation um, from a younger audience to get young people involved? I just say. Um, don't be stuck in your ways. There's a few, well, I'm gonna say there's a stereotype that um, historical societies in particular or historical organizations are usually run by older people, like the old guard, for instance. And you have to be willing to hire younger people, um, take on younger interns, younger volunteers. You have to be willing to embrace the new technology. So digitizing things is very important because I think your younger researchers aren't necessarily going to go to the historical society or the history center in person and sit in the library and look through microfiche. They're going to wanna be able to type it into Google, they're going to want to go on your website and they're going to want to be able to look on the website for digitized things. 
Um, Jamie and I started the videos, um, Hometown History Talks. And those are great because they're 15 minute snapshots of local history. And I think for younger people, it's nice to be able to get a Reader's Digest version of history in a more accessible way. So maybe instead of reading a textbook or you know having to sift through documents at a history um, center to be able to just watch a video and have the Cliff Notes version of what you're looking for presented to you is great. Social media, I can't, I mean, you can't avoid social media today. Facebook, Instagram, even TikTok is being um, utilized by you know, historical societies and history centers. So you just, you have to be willing to branch out. You have to be willing to listen to that younger audience and sort of come to them. You know, they might not necessarily come to you at first, but once you make yourself more accessible and once you're out there on the internet and um, even some events, you know, I've seen there's um, like pub talks. Um, I think Jim brought up to us, it was professors in pubs, I believe you called it, where, you know, there was professors coming to like a happy hour and um, you sit there with them and it's audience participation and they're talking about local history. They're talking about um, historical topics and they're bringing it to a younger audience instead of making the younger audience come to them. Thank you, Dami. Yeah, thank you guys. And um, I'll just put up my information in case anyone wants to contact me. Uh, the history at preservingnewburytown.org is my uh, business email for the website, and then Dominic Miller at Gmail. So thank you so much, you guys, and I really hope you learn to love Newburytown as much as I do. <laughs> I think that just the excitement that Dami has when she shares her stories gets me interested. And as a new resident to Newburytown, I mean, everything she said was spot one. So I bought this house. And it's right on close to the Y that she was talking about. It was from 1931. And my neighbors come over and Dami, of course, knows them. And so their names are Devin Clint. And it turns out that Clint was born in my living room. So his mom gave birth to it. Um, and so they came in and they were scoping out the place. They wanted to see the renovations. And, you know, luckily I'm a historian, so I appreciate the historical, you know, integrity of it. So I don't want to go through and change everything. Um, but then even somebody stopped uh, and asked me about a dumpster that I had. They wanted to know where I got the dumpster and how much I paid for it. And just that friendliness to be able to stop and ask questions and have a conversation, it frankly was remarkable. And so I am happy to live in this town. I may never leave either. I love it that much. <laughs> Clint was my mom's stepdad. Clint was her mom's stepdad. So again, relation there too. Um, so we have someone from the audience that wants to come up again and give another comment. This is Richard. So again, um, Richard Rash, I'm one of the trustees of the West Meeting House in West Bay Iron Township. Meeting House is open just two days a year. The next event coming up is an ice cream social at the uh, West Mannheim House of Park. And then people can walk or drive over to the meeting house for tours. Uh, it's on Sunday, September 29th, from 1 to 4 p.m. And West Mannheim Township is the headquarters of the kind of other people. Well, thanks, Richard. Um, and one last plug. So Dami talked about the significance of writing down in your photograph names and dates. One of the most precious Christmas gifts I ever got was my mom, Al Tyson, gave me her handmade recipes and she wrote down her recipes in a book for me. And I appreciate that because a lot of people think about history as just this abstract idea. It is concrete examples of what my grandma cooked for dinner for my grandpa when they were 18 and married. Those are the types of things that make me feel connected to the past and I can follow it and it's documented. So right now, if you're watching this and you have kids and grandkids that might not be right now interested in history, chances are something's gonna spark their imagination where they wanna find out more. So it is September, you have three more months. I encourage you to write down stories that you have in just a journal and you don't necessarily have to give it to them right now. You can keep it and just keep adding to it. But the more that you document, the more that we then, as the next generation of historians, can go back and look to. Because as Dominique said, a lot of it is oral history and it can be forgotten. So tonight, great presentation. Thank you so much, Dami.
Um, we have our next presentation is going to be in December. That is in three months. We hold these the first Thursday of every three months in December. We're going to have Mayor Helfrick. He's going to speak about Glenn Goodrich. So Glenn Goodrich is the son of the famous businessman, William Goodrich. There is a great center downtown where you can go look where they had the Underground Railroad, um, one of the many gems that we have here in the city. So Glenn, he was also known and prominent in photography. And at the time that was revolutionary. Jim McClure and I just wrote about it in Witnessing New York. So you can read more beforehand. And we look forward to seeing you in December with Mayor. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, everybody.